running here. So good evening, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to our webinar this evening on stallion breeding soundness presented by Dr. Dale Kelly. This webinar was organized by the Fauna Health Committee and is being brought to you by our sponsor, the Fenway Foundation for Frisian Horses. We are recording the webinar tonight and we plan to have it posted in our library in the next few days. And it also should be, should be noted that we're also broadcasting live on Facebook as well. We have a good audience tonight with us and everybody will be in listen only mode if you're here uh, logged into the webinar. So we will stop periodically throughout the presentation when Dr. Kelly gets to a natural change in topic and we'll uh, go ahead and ask your questions. So to submit your question, you can use the question and answer the Q&A box at the bottom screen toolbar. So if you just look down there at the bottom of your screen, you should see that Q&A. So you can click on that and then type in your question and I will see it. And when we get to that break, I will go ahead and read your question to Dr. Kelly. Now, if you're joining us on Facebook, you can write your question in the comments and we'll try to get to them just the same way and get them answered for you. So now a little bit about our presenter. Dr. Kelly grew up in North Carolina and he received his bachelor's degree in animal science from the North Carolina State University. And then he spent a few years training hunter jumpers, which is very interesting, I thought, before returning to school and getting his master's in animal and veterinary sciences from Clemson University. And then he also has a doctorate in veterinary medicine and a PhD in animal molecular biology, or sorry, excuse me, animal molecular and cellular biology from the University of Florida. So very accomplished academically. He then had an ambulatory internship at Root and, Whittle, Root and Riddle Equine Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky, followed by a residency in equine theriogenology at Texas A&M University. He is a diplomat of the American College of Theriogenology Reproduction Specialty and an assistant professor at the Oklahoma State University College of Veterinary Medicine and Theriogenology. His interests are stallion and mayor infertility, and his current research is looking at alternatives to antibiotics and semen extenders, the treatment of hemospermia in stallions, and alternative diagnostics for blocked oviducts in mares. So you're really all over the place when it comes to the research, and that's really fascinating. Welcome, Dr. Kelly. This is quite the resume of oh, goodness. And we are so pleased that you could be here this evening to present this webinar for our members. We've actually, we're talking about this just a moment ago. We've never had a webinar discussing stallion fertility, but I think it's a really important topic for breeders, especially those that are breeding young stallion prospects to learn about. And I also think the mayor owners here tonight will learn something valuable as well. So with that, Dr. Kelly, I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much. Um, and thank you everybody for attending. You know, um, kind of wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, what a breeding soundness exam is in a stallion. And, you know, when I look at equine reproduction, I look at it as there's kind of three parts that have to fit together for it to work effectively. You want to look at, you know, not just the mare fertility side of it and the stallion fertility side of it, but you also want to keep in mind management. And if all these come together um, effectively, you can have, you know, very successful outcomes in terms of pregnancy. But if one side, you know, falters, you know, if you have infertile mares or an infertile stallion or poor breeding management or a combination of that, um, we can have a very, very poor breeding season. So this is kind of touching on, you know, one of those facets, the stallion side, and, you know, kind of giving an idea of what a breeding soundness exam is in a stallion, what it does, and um, what it really doesn't do. And then kind of at the end, we'll talk about, you know, what do we do with this information? You know, how do we use this? Um, and this can have some impact also on, you know, the mayor side, you know, these the mayor owners in terms of, you know, certain recommendations you might have from the person, you know, that's collecting the study and might recommend using certain breeding techniques, things like that. So, you know, basically a breeding soundness examination is to try to determine if a stallion has, you know, the mental and physical capabilities to get a mare pregnant. You know, you wanna make sure they don't have any kind of infectious disease or anything like that, that could, you know, potentially, you know, cause an infection in the mare, you know, some type of venereal disease. And, you know, basically at the end of the breeding season that you have an acceptable pregnancy rate, you know, and we're kind of looking, a lot of this, you know, is kind of population based. I know everybody, you know, is interested in getting their single mare pregnant, but a lot of times, you know, you have to look at it as a whole as well, because, you know, if you look at your mares as a population, you have some mares that are incredibly fertile and other mares that are, are not very fertile. And depending on, you know, the population that a stallion's breeding, it can definitely reflect on his pregnancy rates, whether it's his fault or not. 
So just some basic things that kind of give you a rough idea of what we do. Um, you know, we want to definitely um, test the quantity and quality of the semen. We also want to get an idea of his libido or ability to mate. Um, you know, it's, it doesn't do any good if the stein has the best semen quality, but you can't collect it or you can't get him to breed a mare. Also, we attempt to, you know, try to figure out if there's any congenital defects that could be passed on to offspring. Um, certain, you know, there's definitely some in like warm bloods, you know, they've got the, the um, oh, what is it, the weak foal syndrome that can be inherited. So it's good to identify these things ahead of time, you know, potentially to, to pick the proper mating cross so you don't have some, you know, horrible outcome, you know, in the foal that could have been potentially avoided. And then you also want to try to identify if you have any kind of potential infectious disease that could be spread venerally. You know, and this, this does happen um, sometimes. And, you know, the result is, you know, you have decreased pregnancy rates and then mares have, you know, uterine infections and it just becomes a huge problem. So it's good to kind of identify, you know, when this is occurring and then try to treat it ahead of time so you can get your stallion in shape basically for the breeding season. And then you're trying to find any other issues that could, you know, affect his longevity. So if a horse has, you know, lameness issues or anything like that, that can definitely have an impact on, you know, how things go during the breeding season. And it's kind of important to kind of keep these, you know, big pictures in line. You know, generally as reproductive specialists, we don't think a whole lot about, you know, the other areas like lameness, back pain. Um, I've even seen um, horses with, you know, displaced soft palates and things like that, that had an adverse effect on being able to actually collect the stallion because, you know, you can think about it if a stallion is trying to, you know, perform, and he has significant pain or can't oxygenate, all of these things can have a huge impact on, you know, why, why he's not, you know, able to deliver semen. So some of the basic components when we go through this is, you know, this kind of sounds funny when you say identification and history, but, you know, actually making sure that you have the proper identification of the proper horse is very important. Um, you don't want to, you know, get other horses, you know, horses confused or anything like that. It's always, you want to do a general physical exam, you know, make sure there's not any, you know, kind of physical ailment or anything like that. Sometimes you can have stallions present just for failure to collect. And then that actually becomes um, somewhat challenging because you're trying to separate, you know, is it a physical problem or is it a behavioral problem? And the thing, you know, a lot of times your traditional lameness exams in these cases are not very effective at identifying if they have a back problem or something like that, just because, you know, the sheer mass of the animal. And then we kind of get into our more specific area where we actually do a physical exam of the reproductive tract. We're going to observe his libido and mating ability. We're going to do culture swabs of the penis and prepuce to try to get, you know, a sense if there's any type of venereal disease. If stallions are being imported from overseas, they might be going, um, you know, under quarantine and doing testing for like equine viral arteritis. And then finally, we get to, you know, we analyze the semen or we actually look at some semen parameters. And I'm going to go a little bit more in detail on some of these areas. You know, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about a physical exam or the history or things like that. But these other areas, I'll touch a little bit more in depth, just so you have a better idea of, of what this process is. So, you know, the identification, you know, we want to make sure we get the proper horse. Um, some important things on this is um, breeding records. And I'll talk a little about this later, but um, for me, um, having accurate and up-to-date breeding records is very helpful, particularly when you're dealing with um, problems. You know, trying to figure out when did this start can also help a lot of times in trying to figure out what a potential cause might be. Because unfortunately, a lot of these um, get classified as idiopathic, which basically means we have no idea what the cause is. And then we're basically trying to treat something without understanding the cause. And it, you know, generally the treatment boils down into methods of trying to process the semen to improve the quality or the ability of the mare to get pregnant rather than actually trying to fix the inciting cause of that's causing poor sperm quality. Um, the big thing here is um, paying attention to things that could affect me lameness, um, ataxia, anything like that, you know, you want to make sure we record anything that we find that's abnormal, even if it's just, you know, the teeth aren't very nice, or even, you know, if his body condition score is a little bit low or too fat, you know, all these things could have an impact. And, you know, you also want to think, you know, there can be potentially endocrine diseases that could also, you know, like Cushing's or PPID and things like that, that could have an impact on reproduction. And, you know, if possible, try to address these to improve, um, one, his comfort level, because if he's uncomfortable, it's going to be difficult to collect semen from him. You know, if he has hoof problems or abscesses or navicular disease or something going on, particularly in the hind end, you know, that, that can really cause difficulties, particularly if he has a heavy book size and he's breeding a lot of mares and having to breed very frequently. So on our reproductive exam, we want to evaluate the external genitalia. Um, we want to look at the penis, scrotum, testicles, 
and make sure everything looks normal. Um, generally, as most of you guys have been probably around geldings or stallions, um, you know, a lot of times I get a lot of smegma on the penis. So, you know, before we collect them, we're gonna make sure we wash it. I think it's important to note that you wanna use just water on that. You don't wanna use soap or you don't wanna use detergents because that can predispose them to pathogenic bacterial growth and basically by disrupting the normal microflora. So you just wanna use water. And then on the testes, you know, we're gonna measure the size, symmetry, and consistency on both palpating. And I prefer, they have calipers, but I actually prefer to ultrasound, use an ultrasound to get accurate measurements of the length, width, and height. And this can really help in giving us what we call predictive daily sperm output. So we basically can calculate out the volume. And then there's been, um, somebody did some research, Dr. Love at Texas A&M did research where he figured out the regression line based on the volume and used it to estimate the predictive sperm output of a stallion. And this can be very helpful, um, one, for monitoring, um, because a lot of times stallions can have age-related changes to their sperm quality. Um, and basically, it's called age-related testicular degeneration or idiopathic testicular degeneration. And in these cases, as they get older, basically, their sperm output starts to decline, and eventually, their testes actually start to get smaller. So trying to track these things can try to help identify you know, what's going on, when this is occurring, and you know, try to take strategies to you know, try to help with that. Unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do to treat it, but then you might say, you know, if you start trying to identify it early, you might say, maybe we need to free semen and stockpile it. And, um, you know, this predicted daily sperm output can be compared to his actually daily sperm output to try to give an idea of how efficient he is actually producing sperm. So, you know, ideally everybody, you know, would love to have it at hundred percent, but if it's 50, 60 or 20%, that's good information to try to, you know, figure out, is there something we can do? Is this, you know, a chronic condition, a temporary condition, is this something that, that could be reversed potentially if it's, you know, we can find an inciting cause such as heat stress or illness or something like that. Next, we also um, palpate them and also ultrasound the internal genitalia. So specifically, we want to look at the accessory sex glands. Um, and this is sort of a little picture showing, you know, the ampulla. There's two of them that are actually coming off the vas deferens, which are basically bringing the sperm up from the testes through the epididymis, through the vas deferens, through the ampulla. And then they basically come into a common canal at the urethra. And right around there, we have other glands, such as the vesicular gland, um, the prostate gland, and bulbourethral glands. And of these, probably the vesicular gland is probably the one that can cause the most problems, um, rarely they can actually get an infection. Luckily, it's not too common in this country, but they can actually get an infection in the vesicular gland and have a lot of purulent material in the ejaculate. And this can be very tricky to treat. And unfortunately, on ultrasonography, it's a lot of times stallions with this problem may not have changes that you can actually see on ultrasound or palpate, which is a little bit different than some other species, such as um, bulls. But it's always good to look at these. Um, they can also sometimes have cysts or other things that could potentially cause an obstruction or problem with the ejaculation process. So then we observe the libido and mating ability. So basically um, with this, um, you know, we bring them in. If they're live cover, that's pretty straightforward. But if we're doing, um, you know, artificial collection um, techniques, we still want to get an idea. Do they tease normally? Do they drop? Um, how do they act? You know, you want, you don't, you know, you don't want them to go crazy. You want them to be well-behaved, but you don't want them to be sedate either. You know, they have to kind of be allowed to be a stallion, but within certain limitations. And we want to see, you know, can they, you know, do they have normal copulatory behavior? And, are, you know, do they look like they're doing this pain-free and comfortably and don't have any problems? And then also, um, generally, when we bring them in the breeding shed and they drop, um, before we even wash them, we'll actually take a swab and do a bacterial culture to check for um, some of the bacterial venereal pathogens such as Klebsiella or Pseudomonas. Also, um, we'll look for any lesions on the penis. This is a picture showing lesions that you might see with equine herpes virus type three. Um, this is actually, it's a venereal disease. Luckily, it's not, it's more of an unsightly disease. It doesn't cause any fertility issues or anything, but this can be transmitted to mares and they get these nasty little pustules and sometimes open lesions on the vulva around them. And then also um, testing for things like EVA, particularly like if you're importing stallions from Europe and places like that. So, you know, basically the whole idea here is we just want to make sure, you know, particularly prior to going into a breeding season that they don't have anything that could be transmitted potentially to a mare. Now, if a stallion's never done, done you know, performed live cover, it's probably pretty low likelihood, but it's still a good thing to check because you never know if you had contaminated equipment or something like that that could, you know, end up resulting in something like this. And, you know, the worst thing from a stallion owner, you know, perspective is to get a phone call from a bunch of angry mare owners accusing you of having a stallion that's infecting their mares. 
And unfortunately, this does happen sometimes. And, you know, you have to go through, you know, basically you culture the stallion and prove that he's not growing what their mares are growing. So in our process of doing a BSE, basically what we do is we do two ejaculates collected one hour apart. And the idea is this is trying to give us a, a relatively representative sample of what he could do. And the second ejaculate is really kind of what we're looking at because the first one, if he hasn't been collected in a while, is gonna have a lot of sperm that's accumulated over you know weeks, months, however long it's been. So that one kind of cleans them out. And then that second one is trying to give us a rough idea. And hopefully we should have a 50 to 70% drop in terms of total sperm number from that first ejaculate to kind of get a rough representation. Now this number is not gonna really represent what his actual true daily sperm output is. The only way to do that is to collect the stallion multiple times over multiple days and basically watch and see when his sperm numbers plateau. And that's really the only way to truly get that number. But this kind of gives a little bit of a proxy. And then from here, we're gonna do our evaluation of our semen. And there's other semen diagnostics that we can do. We'll touch a little bit upon that as well. So in our you know, basic evaluation, you know, and I feel like this is stuff that should be done on most of these with the exception of morphology should be done on every single ejaculate. So you're going to do a visual evaluation. You know, you just want to look at it. You know, what color is it? Is it clear? You know, is it opaque? You know, if it's clear, then you worry he didn't ejaculate or he has a production of pro you know, produ problem producing sperm or could have potentially have a blockage in the tract preventing the actual ejaculation. And then also the color is equally important. You know, if it should be white, if it's red, then you're worried about, you know, blood basically coming from somewhere. It could be in the urethra and you're trying to isolate where that's coming from. And the reason being a little bit of blood doesn't necessarily impact fertility. However, once you get higher percentage of blood in the ejaculate, sperm longevity suffers and fertility suffers. And for example, um, you know, talking with a person who's done some research on this, once you get above say 20% blood in the semen, bears don't get pregnant. So there's something in the blood, they're not really sure what, that basically causes infertility. And then evaluating the volume and concentration, and I'll probably touch a little bit on more on concentration. There's several different methods out there. Volume um, can be using a graduated cylinder, or you can actually use a gram scale, and one gram is roughly one mil. And then we'll evaluate the motility as well as morphology. So for our basic color evaluation, this is kind of give you an idea. Um, you know, it should be kind of like the, the picture on the right. It should be kind of like a milky opaque color, um, ivory color, something like that. If it's um, yellow, such like the one in the middle, that could be indicative of urine contamination. And urine can actually be deleterious to sperm longevity as well. And then the one on the, the right is showing you know what blood in the ejaculate looks like. And a lot of times it's actually a very small percentage, but and for whatever reason, that small percentage makes it look very, very bright red. And it's um, rather impressive um, how little blood can actually make it look very red. And then we'll evaluate the volume. And I like to evaluate the volume, not just of the semen, but also the gel fraction and track these, you know, and all this gets recorded. Um, and then we get to measuring concentration. And you can see there's a lot of different ways to do this. And part of it is, um, depends on, you know, the person's budget, um, what they're willing to spend on using and the speed and precision at which they need. So manual counting, um, these two, so this rectangular and circular um, slides at the top, can be done, but they're more time consuming um, because you have to dilute them out, look at them, manually count them under a microscope. Um, you generally want to count in the hemocytometer, the two chambers on the top and bottom. And then if there's more than say a 10% difference, you basically keep repeating it until your number is pretty close and you take an average and then do some math to calculate out, you know, based on your dilution, what your actual concentration is. So you can see this could easily take 15, you know, 20 minutes of time. And if you have a very busy breeding season, you know, you might not want to do that. There's other um, methods, um, the two below the little white box and the little blue box below the top um, two. These are what they call spectrophotometer based methods. Um, one is a spermicue and the other is a decimeter. And these basically work by shining, you know, light through it and measuring the amount of opacity. So what you do is you take a sample and you put it in a cuvette or a slide it shoots light through there and it compares that light to a concentration standard curve, basically. And the reason I bring up, you know, how these work, and I kind of harp on, you know, the veterinary students about this is trying to understand the limitations of the equipment. So using the light passing through it, it not just measures sperm, but anything that can affect the opacity. 
So for example, if you have urine, blood, dirt, um, extender, anything like that would falsely elevate your concentration. So that's something to be aware of that these are designed really just for pure sperm um, with minimal contamination of other material. Once you get contamination of the material, it becomes very inaccurate and actually overestimates your concentration. And um, these machines are also kind of notorious if you have a stallion that is on the very low end of concentration or very high end of concentration, they're not as accurate. And this kind of goes back to a standard curve, which some of you might remember from school. Um, the next one down is um, the nuclear counter. And this is actually a very accurate machine. It actually um, stains the DNA and counts each individual cell. And probably the only limitation or situation where this may not be as accurate in cases where you have white cells in the sperm. So for example, like with a seminal vesiculitis, white cells have nuclei, it's gonna stain those nuclei. So that might be a situation where it's falsely elevated, but it can measure um, sperm in, in extended concentration. So if you got semen shipped in from somewhere to breed your mare, you can double check your concentration in this and trust it'll be accurate. And then you get into um, some of these computer assisted sperm analysis. Um, these aren't very accurate, um, but there's a lot of them out there um, with like the eye sperm is a popular one. And they're basically, you know, using a computer software to count how many sperm are in this, you know, field of view under the microscope and trying to estimate that back to a concentration. A lot of people use these, but I've not found them to be particularly accurate. And um, in my mind, if I had to choose one is the nuclear counter. However, it's a lot more expensive. Um, you know, you can buy used ones anywhere from five, 10,000, but new ones generally are in the range of 15,000. So unless you're doing this a lot, it may not warrant the cost. The spectrophotometers, for example, are usually around 5,000, so they're significantly cheaper. And then these um, microscope slides are about $250. So depending on how much you're doing, you know, and can definitely, you know, if you have one stallion that breeds sometimes, a hemocytometer probably works as well as anything. It's just gonna take more work, but it's also significantly less expensive. So this slide's illustrating that after we get our volume and concentration, we want to really look at the total sperm. And the reason I bring this up is a lot of times um, owners, you know, get, you know, wonder, oh, what was the concentration or what was the volume? And the reality is um, that those two numbers by themselves are, are kind of meaningless because what happens if you have, a, and this is kind of an example. Um, so for example, um, you get about a volume of four mils, and this is actually from a little pony sty, a little Shetland pony sty. And he had 810 million sperm per mil. So we got a total number of about 3.2 billion sperm in that ejaculate. And then we collected them some more times. Another time he gave us six mils, but the concentration was a lot less, but we still had roughly the same number of sperm. And then another time he gave us almost, you know, triple what he did the first ejaculate and, you know, still the same number of sperm. And what happens here is um, a lot of times stallions get in there and they get really teased and really excited and they make a lot of gel from their accessory sex glands gets put in there. So your volume increases but you're only gonna get the same amount of sperm that he produces every day in that, same, that volume. So whether it gives you a little bit of volume or a large amount of volume, you're still gonna have the same number of sperm. And that's really the number that you wanna look at when you're kind of comparing across ejaculates over time. You know, looking at volume, you know, just simply say, oh, maybe you got more teas this day or less teas that day. It really doesn't mean a whole lot of information to me as opposed to that total sperm number. And then um, we get down to looking at motility. And, you know, probably the most used is probably just a visual estimation under a microscope. And it works. It, it actually is really good. I did a little project with some students kind of comparing what they got to what the computer got. And there was no difference. The nice thing about a CASA or computer assisted sperm analysis, which is this kind of fancy looking computer thing, is one, you have like a digital record that you can show people, you know, rather than just taking my word for it. You know, I can show you the computer printout. I can show you computer images. I can actually show you saved video from the analysis. And you can also actually send these to other places that could run them if they've got a similar machine and maybe have a different setup. Now, the caveat with this is it does depend on how you have it set up. So it's, you know, people think, oh, it's computer, so it's not subjective, but it, it is kind of subjective. It's just repeatedly subjective because you're basically programming it how to look at the sperm. And then when you do this, it's very important to make sure you have a consistent concentration. I like to run at about 30 million sperm per mil. And if you get too many sperm in there, and it's the same thing if you're looking under the microscope, if you get too many, it's sort of like you put a hundred people in a tiny room and tell them to move around. But well, you can't really tell who's moving because they're all kind of bouncing into each other. So when you look at this, you want to you know dilute it out to a consistent concentration to try to give the sperm room to move, but you have enough sperm in there to evaluate. 
And this is just sort of illustrating that po this point. Um, on the right is a picture at about 30 million sperm per mil. On the other is close to 60 million sperm per mil. And if you look, the motility, the total motility in the 30 million sperm per mil sample was about 56% and progressive was about 38%. Now the same, same stallion, same ejaculate, you know, it should be the exact same on the more concentrated comes up as almost 78% modal and almost 50% progressively modal. And really it's just overwhelming the computer system, much like it would overwhelm your eye if you were looking at this and make it very difficult to you know, estimate. You tend to over actually overestimate the motility. And you know, this is important, not just to try to get an accurate representation of motility, but you know, if you take a step forward and look at it from a processing semen standpoint, and you're trying to make your calculations based off of your, you know, your total number of sperm and your ejaculate and your progressive motility, if you're falsely elevating your motility, you might actually be sending suboptimal doses to mare owners and consequently start having poor performance or lower pregnancy rates. Another important aspect of the um, breeding science exam is looking at the sperm morphology. And there's a lot of different ways. Um, traditionally, this was done using actual stains and smearing them out on a slide. And, you know, the, the, that, that's okay. Um, that's how the original breeding science exams were done. But now we've got um, much more advanced um, microscopes, um, such as phase contrast or DIC microscopes. And these provide a lot of detail. And I don't know, you know, you can look at this image. And these are um, three different sperms starting from the top right. That is a normal sperm. And then you can see the sperm kind of in the middle going down diagonally. That has a proximal droplet. And then we go to the next one has what we call a hairpin tail. And if you look kind of closely, I don't know if you can see it, but you can see like a little divot in the head. That's a tiny little vacuole in the sperm head. So the trick is with this, you know, is if, you know, it's a norm, otherwise normal sperm, it has a tiny little divot, you know, you wouldn't see this on a stain. You know, this is just how much better these um, imagings are. So you just have to be kind of cautious with, you know, not overcalling defects because, you know, the reality is from, from my standpoint is if I'm very critical of sperm, I'm too critical, for example, and I say this stein has no normal sperm and they turn around and say, wait, doc, he had, you know, he got 80% of his marriage pregnant last year. How do you explain that? You know, so that's why you have to be kind of cautious with some of these um, advanced microscopic techniques because they just provide so much good detail that it's very possible that every sperm is going to have a little fault. It's kind of like going and looking at cars and, you know, faulting it for every little scratch, you know, if it runs great, that's all that matters. You know, if it has a little scratch here or something there, as long as it's not like, you know, the fender's knocked off or something, you know, you know, so that's kind of, you know, you want to be a little cautious on that. All right, so there's some other things that we can do, um, some more advanced diagnostics. And some of these are actually really good and some are, might be good for very specific circumstances. Um, one thing that I do like to do is a longevity test. So after, you know, I collect these stallions for a breeding sinus exam, I always like to save a little sample back and try to mimic the transport conditions if they were being cooled shipped and evaluate them at about 24 and 48 hours of cooling just to see how they perform, you know, and because basically if any, you know, this is probably like to me one of the more important things because if some, for some reason it doesn't last 24 hours and it's all dead, I need to figure out what's going on and how to rectify this. You know, you can have some stallions that have um, issues with their seminal plasma. It's a very small percentage, but they have what we call toxic seminal plasma. And these stallions, when you collect them, it, everything looks really good. And then you put them into cool storage and at 24 hours, they have very low motility. And by 48 hours, almost all the sperm's dead. And there's ways of dealing with this um, and processing the sperm that they actually do quite well after, you know, you, you treat it properly. But if you don't, it does very poorly. And then other diagnostic techniques, um, another really good one is um, this DNA integrity. So it's um, abbreviated SCSA, but it's a sperm chromatin assay or sperm chromatin structure assay. And basically what you're trying to do is look at the percentage of normal sperm with normal DNA. Now, the reason this is um, nice is you can imagine, you know, a sperm has to get there, it has to fertilize an oocyte. But if it's got bad DNA, it might get there, it might fertilize the oocyte. And then that embryo starts to develop, but the DNA is all messed up and it just dies. And there's actually a pretty strong association with um, a high percentage of DNA damaged sperm and low fertility. So that's, that's a really valuable test to potentially do. And this is something, you know, that when you look at morphology and things like that, that you might not see. Generally, if they've got bad morphology, they probably got bad sperm chromatin structure assay, but it's still a good thing to look at just to kind of rule it out. 
Another thing I like to do um, regularly is look at viability of the sperm. And this is basically saying what percentage of sperm have an intact cell membrane. And the thing I like to run, this also you can run on nuclear counter. And part of it is also a checks and balance um, in that if you think about it, if a sperm is viable, it should be moving. So your total sperm motility and your viability should be pretty similar. And you know this is just a good way of making sure that your pipetting technique and all your lab work you're doing is correct. And you're not you know, making a small pipetting mistake that could you know, measure a big error. And another test that can be helpful is um, an acrosome reaction test. And so if you imagine when a sperm you know, goes into a mare, it swims up the oviduct, it gets to the oocyte, it has to undergo what we call an acrosome reaction that allows it to actually penetrate the egg and fertilize it. And there's been some stallions identified um, in different breeds that just have a delayed acrosome reaction and they have low fertility. And a lot of times these stallions have um, very beautiful sperm quality, but they've got poor fertility. And it's been kind of, you know, this test can help kind of find those. And then lastly, um, electron microscopy can be helpful in um, some specific instances where you suspect that there's a structural defect in the actual sperm. So for example, I saw a case um, a few years ago, it was a stallion that had very low motility. It was about 10%. And what was crazy to me is we ran the viability and the viability was really high. It was like 80, 90%. So the first thing we did was we ran, we ran the viability and everything thinking, okay, is this a mistake? You know, do we do some kind of lab processing error? But it kept repeating. We must have ran it like four times and kept getting the same thing. We did a lot of different things. And finally, we sent it out for electron microscopy. And we found that the structure of the tail was not correct, that it was misformed. And that's why the sperm weren't swimming. So unfortunately, you know, fortunately, it gave us an answer. Unfortunately, there's not a lot we could actually do for that case. And then here's a whole host of other diagnostics that can be done under different circumstances. Um, if you have you know, blood in the ejaculate, um, you can do a urethroscopy where you basically put an endoscope up the urethra and actually try to find and locate this tear. This can also be done to, um, if you have some vesiculitis, where you can actually go in, catheterize the vesicular glands. You can use it not only to diagnose by flushing and retrieving fluid back and culturing it, but you can also use it to infuse antibiotics and treat. Very rarely um, radiography um, is ever used. Um, if you did, it would be a contrast studies looking at you know, the vasculature and the penis. Chromosomal um, analysis can be useful, um, particularly in stallions that you know, have a history of infertility, um, that have never been bred before, and you're just, you know, and everything kind of is looking okay, but you're trying to find a reason for, you know, potentially like why is he not producing sperm or why is he got a lot of defects or something like that. And surprisingly, um, uh, you know, sometimes you can see some very um, shocking things. So I saw um, two horses once that were clones and both of them just weren't, you know, they were like four years old. They just didn't have very good semen quality. And we did a chromosomal analysis. And interestingly, one of them actually had chromosomal swapping, basically. So you think, you know, they're both clones. They should be exactly alike. But something happened during the, chrom the cloning process where, you know, the chromosomes kind of got misaligned on one. So sometimes you can see some crazy things like that. Um, also, you can do chemical analysis of the seminal plasma. So for example, if you're suspecting there's urine in the, in the ejaculate, <clears throat> you can actually measure um, creatinine or BUN to basically substantiate what you're thinking. Or if you have a stein that you're trying to collect semen from and you don't have any sperm in the ejaculate, you can look at something, um, another chemistry called um, alkaline phosphatase to determine whether he did in fact ejaculate or not. And then there's a whole host of other ones um, looking at anti-sperm antibodies. So if a stallion's had testicular trauma or something like that, there's a chance that you could have anti-sperm antibodies. So you imagine, you know, these antibodies are attacking the sperm and causing them to basically die and not function properly. And then hormonal analysis, um, these can be done. I don't find necessarily a whole lot of value in them because most of the times um, with testicular problems in stallions, it actually seems to be intrinsic to the testicle and not related to hormones. So for example, in people, a lot of times it's related to um, FSH and they can supplement with FSH to try to improve testicular function. It just really doesn't work in stallions. And then lastly, this is something I don't really advocate ever doing. Um, testicular biopsies are not something I'm, I'm a huge fan of. They do give you a lot of information, but the risks are what concern me um, because you imagine you're poking a needle in testicle and you can basically one, you're causing trauma to the testicle. So now you can increase the risk that maybe they do produce anti-sperm antibodies. Two, they can get a massive hematoma around the testicle because you imagine it's not a very good area to try to put like any kind of pressure bandage on or anything very effectively. So if you get a massive hematoma, all of a sudden you make this 
great big thick insulation there and now you've increased the testicular temperature. And for the testicle to function properly, it needs to be about four degrees Celsius cooler than the body. So for me, it's like if, if you're trying to use it to diagnose a problem, you might get an answer, but you also might cause more problems. So I, I don't really, I try to steer clear of that. I've never had to do one except in a research setting. Um, and that's not something I really ever would want to do. So you get all this information. So, um, you know, what does this tell us? So, you know, I think the biggest drawback is, you know, there can be imprecision because you're dealing with biology and biology is not always consistent. It doesn't necessarily always make sense. And it seems like there's always exceptions to the rule. And like I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of factors that affect fertility. You know, you've got the stallion factors, you know, sperm quality, all of this, mare factors, you know, the mare's intrinsic fertility and management factors on, you know, how's the mare managed, how's the stallion managed. But basically, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I have to figure out, you know, what is this stallion's capability as a sire? You know, do I think he can get mares pregnant or not? Now, ultimately, the best way to know is his fertility is actually retrospectively by looking at breeding records. But if you're getting a new horse, you're trying to basically make your best, for lack of term, best estimation of what's going on. And, you know, basically, if you, we classify them as satisfactory and unsatisfactory, I really don't like that terminology, unsatisfactory, um, because, you know, if you think about it, you know, stallions are a little bit different than, say, the way they select bulls for cows. Bulls, they want to turn them out in the pasture and get, you know, a certain percentage of cows pregnant. And that's basically it. Well, we're not really caring about that so much as we want the stallion for a specific reason, you know, is he's the prettiest or does the best at what he does. And that's why we're selecting him because we think they're going to be a great cross for our mare and produce a good offspring. So if they're satisfactory, it's pretty clear. Um, you want to have 1 billion or more progressively modal morphologically normal sperm in both of the ejaculates that we took one hour apart. And this is based on um, research done decades ago um, out of UPenn. And they're predicting you have at least a 60% pregnancy rate if you're breeding 40 to 45 mares by natural service or 120 to 140 mares by artificial insemination. And, you know, you can see that, you know, it's not like these are great stellar numbers, you know, 60% doesn't, you know, if you got that on a test, you wouldn't be doing so well. But, you know, the reality is um, it's just kind of the nature of the beast. You know, we're trying to do our best to figure out, you know, if we were going to take this guy and breed a bunch of mares today, what's his ability to get these mares pregnant today, you know, and this is sort of what we're trying to estimate by based off of this work that's been done. It's by no way a prediction of what he might do six months from now, because a lot can change, you know, he could get sick, you know, a lot could change in that. So it's, it's definitely not going to predict what his future is going to be. It's just trying to tell us what do we think he could do right now today? And, um, you know, so if they don't have these, you know, people would say they're unsatisfactory to me, you know, I don't like that because it's sort of like, okay, if you tell a client that it's like, okay, great, but you know, I still want to breed them, you know? So for me, you know, I might say, you know, they're for, you know, semen quality is consistent with a diet of lower than average fertility. And then we want to say, okay, here's what we can try to do to me. And, you know, all this for me is used to try to make these decisions as to what we can do. It's very, very rare for a sign to be infertile. And so, for example, like insurance exams, you know, they use this word, you know, we'll cover it if your sign is infertile. But if, as long as you can see a single sperm in there, I can't tell you that a sign is infertile because by definition, it means he, it is impossible for him to get a mare pregnant. So I couldn't tell you that if this sign that maybe had one sperm in there, if he bred a million mares, that one of them might not eventually get pregnant. So, you know, that, that's a, it's a very hard thing to, you know, diagnose a stallion as infertile. Um, we, you know, would say they're subfertile or have lower fertility. And then we try to offer management, you know, to try to work around it the best we can. So this is kind of going back records, um, I can't emphasize enough, are extremely important. You know, frequently one of the first things you might see if you're starting to have a problem is reduction in pregnancy rates. And a lot of people that, you know, manage a lot of studs will actually track these as fast as they can. As soon as they hear a mare is pregnant at 14 days, they put it in their record book and they have like a, basically a rolling average during the breeding season. And if they see things starting to go downhill, they're starting to figure out, okay, let's do a, let's look at a little sample of a sperm, look at the morphology, let's look at the motility, let's try to figure out what's going on. And then at the end of the year, you can also use that information to adjust his book size. You know, if you bred 50 mares this year and every single one of them got pregnant, then you might say, okay, maybe we can bump his book up to 70 mares next year. Or if you bred 50 mares this year and only 30 of them got pregnant or 30% of them got pregnant, you might say, well, let's, maybe we should shrink his book next year, you know? 
So this can help you kind of make management decisions because, you know, the reality is if you're dealing with a stallion and, you know, people talk, you know, mare owners, you know, they might say, oh, I bred that stallion too. Yeah, my mare didn't get pregnant too. And then, you know, that unfortunately that word of mouth thing um, does happen sometimes. And some stallions can get a reputation for diminished fertility. So, you know, you try to adjust, you know, you can adjust that book size to try to keep him at an optimal number that, you know, not only, you know, brings a good income stream, but also gives good fertility rates that hopefully keeps the mare owners happy and repeating coming back and breeding to them. So some things you might look at are your seasonal pregnancy rate. And this is a kind of a misleading number. And the reason is that, um, you know, you could, two stallions could have a similar seasonal pregnancy rate, which just means at the end of the year, 90% of your mares got pregnant. But it doesn't tell you how many times they had to breed these mares to get them pregnant. So, you know, if you had one stallion that took maybe like an average of one and a half breedings per mare to get them pregnant at 90%, that's pretty good. But if you had another stallion that took an average of breeding mares five times to get them pregnant to that 90%, that's not very good. That stallion definitely has issues. So, you know, this can be a misleading statistic, but it's one that people frequently throw out there. Another one that um, I feel like is actually um, probably the best one is the first cycle pregnancy rate. And the reason being is that first cycle, your mare population is a little bit more diverse, meaning you've got mares that have never been bred before, they're maidens, you've got mares that have been bred before, you got your problem mares, you got post foaling mares, you have a very wide population. But then after that, all the easy ones got pregnant. And then the next cycle, you're going to have a little bit more challenging ones. And of those that get pregnant, you're going to, you know, the next cycle, you're going to have the ones left over that are even harder to get pregnant. So when we get down to this per cycle pregnancy rate, that one can kind of be skewed a little bit if you have a lot of repeat mares because they have fertility problems. So these are all good records um, to keep track of that can actually help your veterinarian when they're looking at trying to figure out, is there a problem and when might this have started? All right, so now we get into management. Um, I don't know, does anybody have any questions at this point? Or? I have a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so I'm just gonna go through them. Um, so the first question is about, um, you know, what's the most common reason that people do a breeding soundness exam? And I think, I think what the person is probably thinking is we often take our mares in at the beginning of the season and have them cultured. So this, after we went through it, it kind of sounded like something you would do, if, like you said, if you're getting ready to buy a stallion, but is there sort of a, a an annual checkup the stallions go through and and what would it was is that an abbreviated process of this longer yeah. no so you know this is something i would recommend at the beginning of every breeding season oh wow um, okay you know because you know you don't know what could have happened during winter you know maybe he got an illness um maybe he had an injury you didn't notice that you know, maybe he had a testicular injury you know people don't you know generally go you know looking between their horse's hind legs that closely so this is something I would actually recommend um, at the beginning of any breeding season, you know, like January is a good time, something like that, just to try to get a sense of where is he at. And that way, um, you know, because the biggest problem that happens um, from my perspective is a lot of times we don't see these stallions until they have a problem, meaning mares aren't getting pregnant. And they come in, you know, 15, 16 years old, and you look at the semen quality, and it's not very good. And they're like, okay, well, when did this happen? And I'm like, well, we have no historical information to tell you this. And that can also play a role um, for insured stallions as well. Um, you know, I've had, you know, insurance claims and they are, you know, they want to know, okay, when did this happen? Because they're wondering, was this before the stallion was insured or after? And that can definitely have an impact there as well. So my recommendation, you know, from a planning standpoint, because the other thing is, and we'll kind of talk about this in the management, is based on what you see at the beginning of the year in that breeding soundness exam might change how you manage a semen. You know, if, um, you know, if he has great semen quality, you could probably do, you know, simple dilutions, but maybe he's got low sperm numbers or something like that. And you might have to say, okay, well, we need to um, centrifuge his semen and we need to talk to the mariners about using deep porn uterine insemination. Or maybe it would be better if we can get mares to breed on the farm versus cooled ships. So that, that's my recommendation. And do you find that most people follow that recommendation or? Um, most of the, the, and I, I'm trying to think of the way to phrase like most of the really the big farms that stand stallions professionally do this. Okay. Um, it's probably, you know, like people that have like your, your backyard stallions for lack of a better term, probably don't do it as much as they should. Gotcha. You talked about sheath cleaning earlier and microflora and only using water. Um, 
do you find that when and, and most owner most owners have gelding so i think i guess this could apply to them well but is there is there are there things that could go wrong with the microflora that could cause an infection or so an yeah so um you know with geldings I wouldn't be as worried about it because with stallions, you have to think about, you know, if they're, most stallions are probably on, you know, if they're heavily booked, particularly, they're probably being collected every other day. So they're getting their, you know, their sheath and penis clean, you know, three, you know, times a week. That's a lot. So, you know, if you use soap, I believe, and I might be wrong, I might have this backwards, but if you, soaps have been associated with growing like coliform bacteria on the penis, such as E. coli. And okay. detergents have been associated with growing things like Pseudomonas, which is a venereal, you know, transmitted pathogen. So that's why we recommend not using those is, you know, mainly they're being washed frequently, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't think we know enough about the normal microflora of a stallion's penis to, to really, you know, understand what happens. But certainly um, even washing could potentially disrupt it to some degree. But we're just trying to minimize it by, you know, not, you know, killing the good bacteria and encouraging the bad ones to, to stay there. That makes sense. Um, you had one slide there where you showed a stallion uh, on a dummy mount. And so this question is about how much training goes into that. And, and if there are any negative things that happen during the stallions training, can it affect like mentally affect their performance or behavior, or if they, change barns or change owners, um, how much does that play into their ability to be able to collect frequently and easily? Yeah, so, um, you know, that's, um, I can't say I can give a blanket answer on that because every stallion is different. You know, in terms of training, it, it varies quite a bit. Um, some stallions um, have come in, they're young, have good libido, um, have been well handled and pick up on it the first time. Other stallions, um, if they um, have a background with perhaps they were discouraged from exhibiting any libido, uh, perhaps they were shown or something, mm -hmm. can take several weeks to train. Um, so it, it can be very, it can be quite variable um, in terms of how fast um, they learn, just kind of depending on their background as well as their um, their demeanor. Some stallions are a little bit more aggressive, and some are a little bit more timid. So all of those things can play a big role. Um, how you handle them in there um, can definitely have an impact on how they perform. Um, you know, I think all these different things, if they've had a negative experience, yes, um, stallions, they have good memories for bad things. So if something bad's happened, um, a lot of times that, that can be negative. Sometimes you have stallions that are a little bit thicker skinned and kind of jump back from a little bit better. Um, but, you know, basically you're trying to, um, it's kind of, it's definitely a balancing act between trying to make it a comfortable situation for the stallion while at the same time keeping it safe for all the people involved. So when a stallion is young, like at, at what age or at what point, if you were thinking of using him for a breeding stallion, or, or maybe you were even hoping that he was gonna be selected to go to testing to become an approved stallion in our breed, is there, you know, would you at a certain point say, I'm gonna take this stallion, you know, for training on how to get collected and so, so that way they're off to a good start or you know is there an age that that's appropriate or is it just when you decide you're going to breed this stallion yeah i mean i think most owners it's kind of when they decide to breed it but you know because you, it's you kind of get into the um the balancing act of if they learn you know they have to learn that this is the appropriate time and place for this behavior but then if they go to the horse show you don't want them acting that way so it, that's why a lot of people kind of wait until they actually have their breeding career to start doing that is because, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to throw that kink in the armor. And then all of a sudden the trainer's like, what did you do? You know, I've got a monster here at the show. So, um, you know, you can start training them as early as three years old um, to do it. But, you know, part of that, you know, is going to depend on, you know, because it, it potentially could affect how he acts at the show because now he learns, Oh, Marin heat, I act this way. So now you go to a show and you're riding them and then he sees a mare in heat and it's like oh wait I was allowed to do this at the shed why can't I do this here and so I think a lot of people wait until um you know either they're a little older or had a little more of a performance career so they they really understand what they're allowed to do and where they're allowed to do it because I think that's that's the biggest problem in my mind that makes sense too um so when mare owners receive their semen, like in our breed, it's mostly um, artificial insemination. So, you know, you get it shipped to you typically. Um, so usually your vet would check 
uh, the semen to make sure that uh, the count was good and they're going to go through some statistics. How often do you find that the veterinarians on the mayor side are talking to the stallion station? You know, is there, I'm sure that there are things in uh, shipping that can make the numbers go up and down, but a lot of times, you know, the, I'm assuming the stallion station wouldn't hear from the mayor owner unless they didn't get their mayor pregnant. So is there a good time for like for the owner or the veterinarian to report back to the stallion owner to say this is what we found when it arrived? Certainly yeah, so, it didn't arrive in good shape, I'm sh assuming. Yeah, so what I like to do personally is anytime I ship semen, I like to save a small sample and put it in our own storage conditions. And the reason being is um, you don't know what's going to happen once it gets in that FedEx box and goes out the door. You don't, you don't know if it's, you know, 110 degrees in Phoenix and it gets stuck on the tarmac or what. So, you know, because generally, you know, most of the time when, you know, the stallion people hear back from, you know, the, the mayor side, it's usually not good. It's usually, oh, the semen's dead or some, something's wrong. So I always like to save a small um, aliquot back. And I look at it whether or not I hear back from the vet or not and put that in the record so I can keep track of what he is doing shipment wise. Now, because sometimes what happens is they might say, oh, our semen's dead. And then you look at your sample and it all looks fine. Now you're trying to figure out what happened in between and trying to make sure it's not actually a stallion problem. Um, and, you know, those things can be, you know, tricky because I know like I've received, oh, I had a guest last year, um, and this was from a veterinary clinic that sent the semen and they packaged it completely wrong and all of it leaked into the box. Oh no. Yeah. They, um, like they used whirl packs incorrectly and it just all leaked all over the place. And, you know, that, that unfortunately happens. And, um, you know, you know, we weren't happy and it, we ended up working the, we switched to a different stallion and things worked out fine and the mare got pregnant, but you know, you, you definitely, you know, want to communicate when things aren't going well back to the original clinic and let them know what they can do to improve. Or if they see something as a problem, you know, communicate back and let them know. And I think it's also um, the other time I think is really important is after they breed the mare is to communicate back whether the mare got pregnant or not at that 14 day preg check, because that's valuable information. You know, if they can keep track of how these mares are getting pregnant and if they see there's a problem, then they can start trying to address it on their end. That, this kind of feeds into the next question, which is, uh, you know, there are those um, disposable looking cardboard boxes that, uh, you know, I think they say express on the side or something like that. And then there are the really robust um, pla blue plastic looking uh, shippers. And, you know, is there any correlation to the use of different kinds? Are there any studies that show this one is better than the others or are they all about the same? I think they're all about the same. Um, you know, the Equitainer, that's the blue ones. Those are the original, like, um, ones that came out. Gosh, I guess it's, it's been a while, probably 40, 50 years ago by now, I guess. Um, so those have been out for a while. The, um, the disposable ones are, um, they're a lot less expensive and they actually work, they work just as well. Um, and they, I think they're a lot easier to deal with too. And is it okay to reuse those or is, yes. is that a one-time use? Okay. No, we reuse them all the time. Um which is nice because they're substantially less expensive. And, um, you know, because the only time we really use the Equitainers is for when I'm saving samples in the hospital, you know, to look at later. I'll just use the Equitainer because it's, we don't really use them to ship. We just use the, the disposable ones. Okay. And you know, the, the big thing on that is, you know, because they're so less expensive, if you don't get it back, it's not a big deal. Right, right. Um, let's see here. Um, you talked about um, DNA integrity. Is there are, is there any information on how inbreeding, you know, a stallion's inbreeding coefficient or in, in our breed, we talk a lot about kinship. So the relatedness of that horse to the rest of the population, because as you probably know, we that's a big discussion in our in our breed in, inbreeding and, and such. So uh, are there any studies that show how much inbreeding affects the integrity of DNA or how could you, other than having that analysis done, if you were looking for a stallion prospect, is that something that you would be concerned about? Or yes. Kind of individual? Yeah. So I'm not aware of um, anything looking at um, like a genetic component to it. I think it's um, entirely possible. Uh, I think, you know, if you were looking at a prospect, um, I think it would be worth um, doing a sperm chromatin structure assay 
to be honest. I, it's not, a, I don't think it's a horribly expensive test. It's like a few hundred dollars. And, you know, I think it's valuable information um, to try to get an idea of, you know, basically seeing is everything look like it's supposed to, you know, is he have, you know, good swimmers and, you know, does it look like the DNA is going to be, you know, is normal enough that we're not going to have a problem on that end. And, you know, I always think it's good, you know, because, you know, a lot of times I'm dealing with these cases with very little history that have a problem. So it's always good to have information ahead of time to know um, where did he start? You know, was this something that he started out with or is this something that developed over time? Um, and there, there's, there is a gene out there, but it's only related to thoroughbreds right now, I believe. Right. Can you touch on that? There's a question yeah. about that. So, um, they found there are other breeds, like they've looked at Hanoverians and, they, and other, um, some other breeds, and they found that, you know, they have this subset of stallions that have um, a delayed acrosome reaction. So we do this acrosome reaction test and it's very, very slow. It takes hours for them to react. In thoroughbreds, um, this condition has been associated with a gene called FKBB6. However, it has not been associated with, um, in other breeds with this gene. So they're not really sure, you know, if it's a cause or effect or it just happens to be, you know, just this is, happens to be really close to whatever the causative thing is. So that's not really clear. Um, but what's interesting about these stallions that have this um, condition is they actually have really good looking sperm quality and they've got really low fertility. So, you know, basically they would pass a, a traditional BSE. And yet when you go to breed mares, you, you know, the bad ones might get 10% pregnancy rates for the year. And the, the good ones might get 30% pregnancy rates for the year. So that, that's a kind of a tricky thing. And that's where doing like the acrosome reaction test um, is actually, I think, pretty handy um, as an adjunct test. Um, you know, the sperm chromatin structure and um, doing the acrosome reaction test, I think, are both pretty handy. You know, I don't say, I don't think, people, you know, we don't typically do that to screen for because it's a fairly low percentage of stallions that have this condition. And it's generally noted. Um, kind of after the fact, you know, you go back and look at your breeding season and you're like, wow, that was um, really bad. And then you start trying to figure out what's going on. And that's when you start doing these. Got you. Um, last question here for this segment is um, cost. So we got the rundown of, of all that great stuff you could do. What does that like ballpark figure run a stallion owner to do that every year? Yeah. So, you know, a BSE is probably going to cost, and it depends on, um, you know, where you're at and who's doing it and all that, but you're probably looking, you know, in the $500 give or take um, range for a BSE. Okay. So, you know, it's not, you know, in my mind, it's not horribly expensive. You know, if you're breeding a lot of mares, you know, if you're breeding one or two, you're probably, you know, you could probably slide by without it. But if you've got, you know, a pretty good book size, to me, it's a, a smart idea um, just to see where you're at before you start the season to um, try to figure out the best way to manage it. Got you. Okay. I think that covers all the questions that I've got so far. So proceed. All right. So um, kind of going into the management. So, you know, the biggest problem um, with fertility problems is it's really difficult to treat them if you can't figure out what caused it. And, you know, this is where, you know, a good history and things can be very important because, you know, if you think back spermatogenesis, um, it takes about 60 days. So, you know, if you have something, you know, bad happened today, um, if you say, for example, heat stress, it got really crazy hot, the sperm quality actually diminishes really quick. It can be over a couple of days and the sperm quality gets really bad, but it's going to take about two months for it to get back to normal. So, you know, this is where, you know, a good history of illness or heat stress or um, medications is important because there are some medications that can affect fertility. Um, you know, generally you want to stay away from like steroids, um, a lot of different things like that. Um, you know, progesterone, don't give that, you know, I know, I've heard of people trying to give that like altrinogest to calm their stallion down. Don't do that because it will suppress um, testicular function and cause a stallion to have very poor sperm production. Um, unfortunately, most of the time we can't really find a cause. And really what we have to do is then kind of go into how we process the semen and manage the breeding. So a lot of times, probably most of the people that deal with steins are probably pretty familiar with what I call simple dilution. And this is kind of like, it's just the easiest, oldest way probably that's been around for a long time. And, you know, basically if you're breeding a mare on the farm, you just do a one-to-one -one dilution of semen to extender, and you want to make sure you have 500 million progressively modal sperm. And all of these, you want to try to keep your volume, um, you know, minimal, minimize. You don't want to go above, you know, 50 or 60 mils, because if you imagine if you 
put you know a bunch of fluid in a mare when they're in heat the cervix is open they're going to get most of it back out the same way it came in so you're trying to minimize that volume because they're going to to extrude you know at the cervix the vast majority of it now if we're doing cooled shipped um, you know generally you're going to want to do a minimum of four parts extender to one part semen and you actually want after it's diluted to have a concentration of sperm between 25 and 50 million. And studies have shown that this is kind of the optimal um, concentration of sperm for survival. And you wanna have um, about a billion progressively modal sperm for shipping. And the reason they had that number doubled from on farm is they basically assumed about a 50% loss. And these are basically like the traditional dogma. Now, the reality is, um, you know, the optimal number of sperm to breed from a stallion is actually dependent on that stallion. And you can get mares pregnant with as little as 250 million progressively modal sperm. And, you know, it's done routinely and regularly on, you know, some stallions, but it does depend on each stallion's individual fertility. So kind of what I'm representing here is sort of the industry dogma that's kind of been around for a while. Um, but, you know, things can be done a lot differently and still give you very good fertility and might be indicated in the management of some stallions. Because, you know, one problem you get into is, um, some stallions are extremely popular. So, you know, the problem you run into is you could have somebody say, well, I could send you this industry norm that, you know, is the traditional dogma, but then this other person is not going to get any semen. So then, you know, you got, you know, one person going, oh man, or they, you know, split to smaller breeding doses. And if they keep good records, they can look back and see what the breeding doses they've been sending and look at his fertility. And they can basically figure out, is this something that we can do and still get good fertility and get all the mares bred on a given cycle versus having to kind of say, okay, these ones get excluded and these ones, you know, get bred. So these are um, some different strategies and things that you have to kind of take into consideration to kind of balance everything out because it can be very challenging. You know, nobody, you know, you know, nobody wants to sit there and tell a mare owner that they can't breed their mare when she's ready to get bred. That is not something anybody ever wants to do that. So um, this is actually works for most dyings. Um, you know, it's not really my favorite processing technique, but it's fast, it's easy, and this is what most people do. The next technique is what we call cushion centrifugation. And this is actually probably my favorite technique, but it takes about 20 minutes of processing to do because you have to spin it down and you're concentrating the, the semen or the sperm number, and you're basically removing the excess fluid. And what's interesting with this is, um, one, it allows you to minimize the volume, Two, you know, it allows you to maximize the number of sperm. So for example, you know, if I have a stein I collected and I've got 60 mils and plenty of sperm in there, if I do a one to four dilution, well, I'm sending you, I'm not sending you all the sperm at that point because, you know, I, I'd be spending you like a large volume, you know, basically what, five times 60, so like 300 mils. Well, nobody's going to put that in their mare. But if I take that semen and I cushion centrifuge it, I can send you all the sperm and I can put it in 20, 30 or 40 mil volume. So now you've got every single sperm that we were able to collect out of that sty in that day. And you, you know, intuitively, the more sperm you put in there, you should have a better chance of getting them here pregnant. So this is a technique that I like because we can reduce this volume. We can increase the number of sperm per mil. And this is really helpful in some styes that have um, very dilute semen, meaning if you have less than 125 million sperm per mil, if you um, try to do a simple dilution, you're gonna have a very dilute sample and you're gonna fail to get enough sperm in it in a low enough volume to really effectively you know, breed the mare. So you can use this technique to centrifuge it, concentrate your sperm, reduce your volume. And the nice thing is um, this cushion kind of minimizes the trauma to the sperm because you can, you know, basically it acts like a little pillow that the sperm kind of land on top of when it centrifuges and keeps from packing too densely. So this is a really good technique that I like, and I actually like to do it for pretty much all breedings. Another technique that can be useful, um, and this is good for stallions with um, sperm, poor sperm morphology, and it's kind of nice if they've got a good number of total sperm. And what this is, um, it's called Equipure, and it's called, um, basically it's a density gradient centrifugation technique. And what it does is it basically selects the good sperm. So you put this solution in the bottom of a tube and then you layer your sperm extender solution on top of it and you centrifuge it. And the good sperm go to the very bottom and the bad sperm kind of get caught up in this. It's almost like a filter. Now the, the caveat is um, you always want to do a test trial with this before you use it on a stallion because 
there are some sperm morphological abnormalities that can actually get worse with this. So you always wanna you know, give this a test run um, and see if it actually helps or not. So before you actually start sending out samples to breed mares with it. And the other negative thing about it is the recovery rates are pretty low. So if you're using cushion, cushion, cushion centrifugation, like we talked about a second ago, you should get greater than a 95% recovery rate. So you should get almost all your sperm back. If you use this um, because you're filtering out sperm, your recovery rates are typically gonna be about 30%. They're gonna be a lot lower and it could actually be substantially worse um, depending on the quality of the semen. So if you have really, Stein has really bad quality semen, you could have you know 10% recovery rate. And so if you're starting out with low sperm numbers to begin with, you've really got low sperm numbers after doing this, no matter how well it cleans it up. So this is something you wanna kind of look at and you know, one, see what did it do to the morphology? Did it help it or did it change it in any positive way or did it hurt it? And you also, when you do this, wanna look at your recovery rate. You know, so if you know, you're done doing this and your recovery rate's so low that you barely have enough sperm to send any breeding dose, this is probably not worth doing. But this is something that we definitely look at. Um, and you know, this is where we kind of get into, um, you know, we have, if we identify a problem, we kind of go through a series of tests. We're kind of like, okay, let's try this. We're going to try this, try this. And then we're going to see what we get at the end. And basically repeat like the longevity we talked about where you put it in cool storage for 24, 40 hours and try to see, all right, what conditions, what extenders work the best, what processing techniques work the best to try to maximize what we get at the end. And then this is the last thing I want to touch on. And ICSI's kind of gotten um, pretty popular where, you know, they go in and they harvest ovaries from a mare using an ultrasound and a needle and they poke them and harvest them out. And, you know, they use this for mares a lot of times to try to increase the number of foals they can have a given year. Um, and this actually was originally intended for stallions with per poor sperm quality. So, you know, what they basically can do is they can go on a microscope and they can find one good swimming sperm and they can take it and they can inject it into an egg. And this is one technique. And this is why I say, you know, like, I hate to say a stallion is infertile because if he's got one good swimming sperm, you can do this and still get foals. It's not a cheap thing. It's, um, I think, it, gosh, it's about probably going to cost probably in the neighborhood of $10,000 per foal. But, you know, if, if the genetics are there, it could be a worthwhile way of, you know, propagating. it. And then, you know, from after they've injected it, basically this egg sperm combination is monitored um, and incubated and they want to see that it develops into an embryo. And if it does develop into an embryo, then it gets transferred into a recipient mare who carries it to term and hopefully gives a live foal. All right, and then um, is there any questions on these things before I go a little bit further? No questions right now. All right, so then lastly, I just wanna to touch on mare management because I think this is a very um, important aspect. You know, if you have a stallion that maybe has fertility issues, um, you know, your best bet, you know, is gonna be probably breeding on the farm. You know, the worst bet would be using frozen semen. Um, from him if he's already got fertility issues. And conversely, if you have a mare with fertility issues, um, frozen semen is gonna be a bad idea. You know, and then cooled ship semen, you know, it can give decent pregnancy rates as well. Um, partly it depends on, you know, if your stallion has longevity issues or not, how well does the sperm survive cooling? Um, if it survives well, you know, that's it, definitely worthwhile. But if it doesn't survive as well, it might be worth, you know, considering shipping your mare to the stallion to try to maximize the chance. And the other thing, um, you know, you never like to talk about this, I guess, but, you know, stallion farms kind of play preferential favorites. You know, if they have X number of mares they need to breed and X number, you know, these number, these mares are on the farm and they get X plus five and these five are shipped. A lot of times they give preferential treatment to what's on the farm versus the shipping. And that's something to bear in mind. It's not something you really like to think about, but that's just kind of how the breeding industry works, unfortunately. And then lastly, um, other things you can do on the mare side is um, things like deep horn, um, deep uterine horn artificial insemination, where you actually take your semen and actually deposit up near the oviduct um, to where the sperm should be going to fertilize the egg. So you're giving it less distance to have to swim. And this can be very useful, um, not just for stallion reasons, but also mare reasons, because um, you can use a much smaller volume, like one or two milliliters of semen. And, you know, I've, I've done this many, many times and got many mares pregnant where, you know, you have 250 million sperm and two mils of semen, you know, basically a two mil volume and you deposit in that uterine horn and allow it to do its job. So it's a little bit different than you depositing, you know, 40 or 50 mils in the body. You're depositing a much smaller volume in a specific location and trying to get the sperm a little bit closer to where they can actually do their job. 
So, all right, and this was kind of going back to one of the questions on recommendations. So, um, you know, anytime you purchase a stallion, I think it's a good idea. Um, and I think um, prior to the breeding season, any basically any breeding season, if it's first breeding season or any breeding season, I think it's, um, I really do think it's a good idea. You need to know what you're getting yourself into and plan accordingly. Um, you know, we had one stallion um, last year that had very low sperm numbers and, you know, definitely, you know, I made some modifications to what, you know, the plan was because, you know, in my mind, um, if you don't nip the problem in the bud in the beginning of the breeding season, it's going to accumulate as you go further in the breeding season. And what I mean by that is, you know, the beginning of the breeding season, you might get, you know, a couple of mares here and there to breed. And if they don't get pregnant, then they're going to add on to those other mares that start coming into the books later on. And if they don't get pregnant, it's just going to keep adding and adding. And next thing you know, you've got, you know, 10 or 12 mares you have to ship to today. And maybe the stallion only gives enough semen to breed two or three mares in a day. So that's where, you know, I think, you know, the breeding soundness exam can kind of help you formulate, okay, um, here's what we need to do to try to streamline and make sure we get mares pregnant the first time. So we don't get this snowball effect where we're getting way more mares to breed in a given day than we're going to possibly be able to. And then um, I think it's also a good idea if you suspect you're having a fertility issue, um, monitoring the sperm morphology, and you can send these samples into a veterinary clinic, um, but monitoring it like every three to six months to see, is it changing? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Are we staying the same? And that might, you know, try to try to figure out strategies based on that as well. And also track these changes, um, you know, to try to get a prognosis for what, you know, your breeding season may have in store or what you might want to do next year. All right. So basically, um, take home message. Um, you know, this is a, really a good tool to help, you know, try to figure out, okay, how many mares can we breed in a given season? Um, how are we going to process this semen? And then, um, Help give recommendations to the, the mare owner like okay you know based on what we're saying you might want to do deep corn insemination with your mare and you know some things this really isn't is it's not going to tell you the future fertility of your stallion in a year or so but it tries to give you a picture of what are we seeing right now and you know that's kind of why you know looking at the morphology over time can be useful because you don't know what's going to happen in three four five six months um, things change um, you know i've seen all sorts of stat crazy things where stallions presenting for infertility. I have seen one stallion that came in and the veterinarian said he has no modal sperm. And we collected him and he had all, like he actually had really good motility. And we were like, well, that doesn't make any sense. So then we got the AV, an AV that the veterinarian was using and we collected him in that. All the sperm was dead. And it turned out the AV, for whatever reason, the latex they used to make it was actually toxic to the sperm. So, you know, you can see all sorts of um, crazy things happen out there and, you know, kind of, you know, this BSE can try to help tailor in, you know, okay, if this is what he was at the beginning of the year and this is where he's at now, what changed in the meantime? Maybe it was a stallion or it could have been something, you know, you know, management related, like, okay, maybe you got different AVs in or different extenders or something, you know, something changed in the lab that, you know, is killing it in the lab. So there's a lot of quality control mechanisms, not just, you know, and this kind of gets back to the, the earlier point about, you know, mare factors, stallion factors, and then these management factors, you know, all these play a huge role and you don't want to get really focused on one particular factor without, you know, looking at all of them. You want to keep them all in mind. And with that, um, I thank everybody for being here. And um, if anybody has any other questions, I'd be happy to, to try to answer them. I do have a couple here and I'll tell the audience if you are thinking of a question, go ahead and type it in the Q&A box because when we get to end of the, the end of these questions that I've got here already, then we'll, um, we'll conclude the webinar. So um, the first one is about extenders. Um, I know there are some uh, that are not good for certain mares or they react to them. Is, is it the same for stallions? How do you choose the best extender? So generally, um, Inter-96 is one that I really like. Um, I've had good luck with that. But, you know, you can do an extender trial. So, you know, we've got, uh, I think we've got half a dozen different cool shipping extenders. So if I look at his longevity and I'm not real happy with it, I will basically just, what I, you know, take a little sample and extend it in each of the different extenders and look at it after 24 or 48 hours and try to figure out what did he do the best in. Uh, most of the time it does turn out to be Inter-96, but sometimes other extenders do perform a little bit better and then you just use those extenders in that particular stallion. 
Okay. Um, this one is coming from Facebook. Can a vet receiving cooled semen from a stallion station freeze unused semen or is the quality already too degraded from shipping? So people have actually looked at that and you can um, freeze previously cooled ship semen. You know, so the short answer is yes, you can do that. It might not freeze as well as if it was freshly collected, but it should depend. Yes, part of it might not freeze as well as if Sorry. it was. So um, part of it also um, could be, um, and part of it depends on the stallion, really. So if the stallion's got really good sperm quality and what you received is good, then yes, you definitely can freeze it. If the sperm quality is not very good, um, you know, then you probably shouldn't. Now, the thing you get into um, is if you're like a mare owner freezing the semen, um, you've got to make sure that that's okay with the, the stud so you don't get any kind of legal trouble um, with that. That makes perfect sense. You would not want that to happen. Um, uh, this one's about um, if you have a stallion that is unexpectedly deceased and you haven't, uh, you haven't banked any <laughs> semen, can you harvest the testicles? How long do you have to do that? And is it successful generally or not? Um, so yes, um, you can harvest the testicles. Um, what you actually want to get is the epididymis, both epididymides. And that's actually what we will um, flush um, with um, extender to get the sperm out. Generally, you want to try to get the testicles out as soon as possible. Me, I prefer, if I do it, I prefer to actually put them under field anesthesia, harvest the testicles, and then euthanize them. Um, the re if, you're, if you're in a euthanasia situation, the reason being is I don't know how euthanasia could affect the sperm. And um, then you would like to get them, you put them in some kind of can, like Ziploc bag or something so that's watertight and you can put them on ice and you, want to, you don't want them frozen, but you want them cooled like refrigerator temperature. And they'd like to have them processed the sooner the better, but definitely within 24 hours. And now the problem you get with on our end is when we receive these is if the stein has never had a semen frozen before, we have to try to make a best guess as to what extender might work. And not all extenders work the same in all stallions. Some do really well in certain ones and don't do well in others. You know, we have a pretty good sense like what extenders most stallions do well in, but there's always exceptions. And then there's always some stallions that just don't freeze well. So, you know, how successful is it? Um, I'd say most of the time, you know, you definitely, nine times out of 10, you get quality enough semen frozen that it's usable. But every now and then you do have a stallion for whatever reason doesn't freeze well. And there's no way of predicting that that's the bad part. Unless you've already done like some freezing work on it and already have a good idea of what works the best with it. Okay. And if you were going to collect uh, your stallion so that you could uh, bank some frozen semen, what would be the best time of year to do that? Would that be after breeding season, during breeding season, or does it matter at all? Yeah, in my mind, it doesn't really matter so much. Um, the biggest this biggest problem with doing it during breeding season, if you have a heavy book of mares, is trying to fit it in the schedule. So a lot of people tend to do it, you know, either at the end of the breeding season um, or the beginning of the breeding season, somewhere like that, just because it, you know, you, you don't have as many mares to breed. So you're not, you know, having to like try to, you know, oh, I've got like a partial collection because, you know, every time you freeze it, it's, you know, you know, if you're only freezing like half of an ejaculate, you're really not maximizing your numbers very well. So I, pretend, I prefer to do it kind of either the end of the breeding season, sometime in the off season, um, just so you're not having that competition with, you know, your cool ship semen. Okay, and so this question is about timing for collection. So, so at least in, in our breed, it's, it's typical for stallion stations to set their collection days and you kind of have to work around that if you're a mayor owner. Is that based on something particular is it is that just the schedule of the stallion station or is there anything saying that you shouldn't collect a stallion every day or so many days a week yeah so um you know basically the idea behind that is uh, if you work around stallions that have heavy breeding loads by the end of the season they get tired like they're not real excited about their job um you know for example in the thoroughbred industry some of these popular stallions might breed mares six times a day every day 
And it like by the end of the year, they they're like dragging them to the shed. Like they don't want to go. So, you know, a lot of it um, from one standpoint is you don't want to overwork them because that can make their job difficult. Now, the other thing is with um, you're collecting off for artificial insemination is if you collect them every other day, you get, you know, to an average sperm output, but you can collect them every day and you get a little bit more sperm per collection. But at the same time, you know, you're not overworking them. So I think, you know, that's the big thing is, you know, they're trying to remember, you know, these are, you know, individuals. It's, yeah, they have a job to do, but they can't actually get burnt out at it, you know, which people don't really think, you know. So I think, you know, that's what they're trying to do is, um, one, you know, trying to keep the stallion from getting burnt out. Two, a lot of these farms, if you stand 20 or 30 stallions, well, you don't have time to collect every stallion every day. So you have to separate them off to try to manage um manage it a little bit better and that's another factor as well that that factors in um if you're looking to bank semen would you do that uh, when the stallion is younger like three or four years old or would you wait till he's more mature like 10 years is there any rhyme or reason to when when you would want to do that yeah um me so part of it depends on his popularity um you know because i mean i feel like economics kind of always comes into this now um you know, I'd say, you know, probably like five or six years old is probably where you would expect him to have like his peak period in terms of sperm number and sperm quality. That's where I would kind of expect him to be peaking somewhere in there, somewhere up between, you know, five, six, to maybe eight. That's probably when I would really start to, you know, try to freeze it because after they get older, you know, you get into these age related testicular changes. And, you know, what happens a lot of times is people start thinking about freezing when they get older and the sperm quality is declining so it's not going to freeze as well so you know when they're younger they might have like 90 percent motility and that's like a great time to freeze because you usually expect the motility to drop about 50 percent with freezing but you know once they get older if you're starting you know if down, they're down to 60 percent motility well now your motility is down to you know 30 percent probably and what happens is that has a huge effect on your um how many breeding doses you get as well as um how many straws you need to use per breeding dose Okay, and then our last question is about EVA vaccines. So if you have a young colt and you're thinking of using him as a breeding stallion at some point or hoping to, when would you want to, would you want to vaccinate him for EVA and when would you want to do that? Yeah, so I mean, in this country, um, we don't commonly vaccinate for EVA. Um, in Europe, it's much more popular. It's much more of a concern. Um, you know, we do have outbreaks. I, don't, I can't even think of when the last one was. It's been a while. But um, we commonly don't um, vaccinate for that just because it's not as much of an issue. Um, the biggest probably dilemma with vaccines is um, once they've been vaccinated, um, when you take titers, they're going to be positive. So then it makes it hard to identify them, um, um, much harder to identify positives. You have to make sure that you keep good records on vaccination so if they have positive titers. Okay, that was our last question. So um, we wanna thank you, Dr. Kelly, on behalf of the health committee and our sponsor, the Fenway Foundation for Frisian Horses. Um, we're, we appreciate so much that you were able to be here tonight and to do this important webinar. And uh, as a reminder to anyone that's watching, um, the webinar was recorded, so we will be adding it to our library soon. And to view it, you would just go to www.fauna.com and look for the webinars icon right on the homepage. If you have any additional questions, you can see Dr. Kelly's uh, email address right there, his contact information. So please feel free to reach out to him or alternatively, you can always send them to the Fauna office, fauna at fauna.com and we'll make sure that they get sent to Dr. Kelly for a response. So. Thanks, Dr. Kelly. We appreciate um, this is the second webinar that you guys have done for us. We just had one last week on um, mayor management. So I think our breeding season off, is off to a really good start with this really helpful educational information. And uh, we're so glad that you could be here. And thanks for taking the time tonight. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And I hope um, everybody learned something. OK, well, good night, everyone. We'll see you at the next webinar. No, thank you.